All right, good morning. Um, uh, I want to do what I did it uh, last time around the test, just to walk very quickly through the test questions and uh, sort of test myself. How would I respond to them? Uh, uh, there's a lot for today to cover, so um, I will rush. Um, uh, well, let me just one more time emphasize uh, uh, you have plenty of time to do that, right? Uh, I have a discussion section at 7, so I don't want to risk that something is going on wrong with the Internet, so I will post this before my discussion section, uh, before 7. Exactly when, I don't know. I mean, I have these anxieties, what uh, Hobbes was talking about, and therefore I don't want... I, I prefer to be five minutes early rather than being an hour late, right? So some, sometimes before 7 you will find it and you have to send your answer around 9 o'clock. Uh, if, uh, 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 you know, some of you communicated that uh, you need another time because you are uh, already engagements, uh, um, it is always uh, you have to work this out with your uh, discussion section leader, right? Um, and your discussion section leader will take care of your, your needs. Um, uh, and be, be brief, right? Sort of the two questions should be about uh, more like four to six um, double-spaced uh, pages rather than much longer. I mean, we will accept eight. So we will not, you, you will not be penalized if you are longer, but the point is not to be long, but to, to, be, to be crispy. Um, and again, the point is, you know, you, know, you try to show uh, uh, the different views of the authors and then comment on it, whether, what, which is more sensible, right? And a third, a third, a third, right, of a paper goes this way. A, you, you spend a third presenting one author, a third a, about an opponent of that author, and then uh, your reflections on it, right? That's about it. So let me then rush through. This is a, not an easy question, right? Marx's theory of alienation, Nietzsche, or Freud's theory of uh, uh, civilization. I mean, there is a common feature, right, between the three authors. Uh, uh, this really asks to create a controversy between the two, right? You can pick two, uh, usually. Um, the common feature is that they are all concerned about modernity um, and people's sense of being lost and being without control in modernity. And the problem of modernity is that we are too much controlled and the control is increasingly inside us rather than outside and coercive, right? I think that's the common feeling. Uh, uh, I think I made uh, uh, this point uh, uh, in, in the lecture. Um, if you read uh, 20th century literature, particularly first half, you find this feeling expressed by a lot of novelists. You read Franz Kafka, right? Uh, uh, you, you read uh, Albert Camus, that's where you get that same feeling expressed uh, to what Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud are responding to. But there are big differences, right? Uh, Marx uh, uh, tries to move away from Hegel and uh, wants to come down to earth and offer a theory of alienation which is rooted in the economy, in t into the production process. And Marx has a view of what emancipated society will be and he even has a historic agent who will get us there uh, to emancipation, the proletariat. Uh, now, Nietzsche is very different, right? The genealogical method does not really offer you the right solution, right? The genealogical method uh, only shows you uh, what is unique uh, in modernity, in modern morality, in the Judeo-Christian morality, what you think is so attractive and so noble and he shows, right, um, how, right, in the workshop 
where ideas are produced, it's actually torture and oppression what operates, right? So there is no uh, good society and no agent who will get you there, right? You have to do it by yourself. Now, Freud is also sees civilization um, as uh, coming from repression of sexual drives. Uh, so he is a critique of civilization, right? Um, but at the same time, Freud has this dual attitude about civilization, right? Uh, civilization is coming from repression, but it is still sublimation. And the most beautiful things uh, in human society, art and science, are coming from this sublimation. And he is also reflecting his writing in 1930 to the rise of Nazism and anti-civilization. Right, and he does not want to support that, right? So in a way, you know, one can say that what he does not have, he does not offer you um, uh, uh, the vision of good society. To some extent, he is with Nietzsche. He said, you have to emancipate yourself. You have to figure out for yourself what your problem is. Uh, and he does, certainly does not have a historic agent like Marx has. Anyway, this is the way how I would be dealing with this. And I will, will not tell you what my opinion is. I want to hear your opinion about it. Uh, okay, the second question. Uh, that's not, not easy either. Practical theory of th uh, truths and Nietzsche genealogical method. Well, there is again a common element between uh, Marx and Nietzsche. Neither of them believes in objective abstract truths, right? Um, uh, Marx says there is no objective abstract truth. Uh, truth is a practical question. Truth is being achieved by, the in, by human practices, right? Uh, and Nietzsche, of course, does not believe in, in, in ob objective truths, right? Uh, he's trying to find truths. But truth is being accomplished by comparing, you know, different uh, notions of morality and to show that in comparison with each other, both have its upsides and downsides, right? So there is, uh, um, uh, 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 he, by the way, Nietzsche, don't misunderstand him. He is not a nihilist. He, doesn't, he does not say everything goes. Nihilism... Uh, is, is, is a very negative term for Nietzsche. So he does not want to say there is no truth at all. He said truth is just relative and you can arrive at critical understanding of your situation by comparing your situation with, with an other one. There is, of course, a very fundamental difference again between uh, Marx um, and Nietzsche because what is this practical truth? These are human activities, and Marx basically arrives at these human activities uh, uh, through changing the physical world, through the system of production. And again, he has the agent who is, uh, 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 this is the revolutionary practices of the proletariat, which will get you to the truth. There is nothing like that in Nietzsche, right? Nietzsche does not have a historical agent and does not have uh, the society uh, where, after all, uh, 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 you will get uh, uh, to true society. Well, this is actually a very simple question. Can, you know, many of you did not like it, so I'm, con you know, I'm thinking very hard whether to put it on. It's a bit narrow, but very simple. Um, German ideology and the Grundrisse. Uh, very simple. The, there are two unique features in the German ideology. One is when he, de he does develop the notion of mode of production for the first time in this book, 45, uh, 1845. But he d does identify the nature of a, 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 a mode of production primarily by division of labor. And this doesn't serve him very well because the division of labor does not capture the conflictuous relationship between classes which eventually will have to lead to revolution. So he abandons, he does not finish the book because only at the very end of the book does he realize that uh, uh, the two components of uh, uh, mode of production are uh, 
forces of production technology and relations of production and relations of production uh, for most of the German ideology is division of labor. And then he realizes, no, 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 it is not division of labor, but uh, property relations. The relationship between those who have property and those who do not have property. Um, and he also has a very deterministic view of history in the German ideology. All societies have to go through the same modes of production. Uh, tribalism, slave mode of production, feudalism, and capitalism. Uh, in the Grundrisse, there are two big innovations. Now the center is property relations, uh, history, the, uh, the, the peak of history of capitalism, when the producer is separated from the means of production completely. Um, and he breaks from the uh, uh, deterministic view of history, right? Now he has this multilinear uh, development of history. Not every society has to come through slavery and feudalism. The Asiatic societies in a, a quasi-communal society can move directly into capitalism. Okay, so that's basically a very simple question. Uh, I probably did a very bad job in the lecture that this did not become clearer. Uh, so four, Marx is a historical materialist, and compare him with Freud. Well, uh, I actually am inspired here by uh, Jürgen Habermas. And Jürgen Habermas says, well, Marx in the thesis on Feuerbach got it right when he said that the real point of departure is census human activity. Uh, at that time when Habermas was writing this, he was still a materialist. Then he had his culture turn, and he's probably not a materialist any longer. He said materialism is, if your point of departure is what you can get through your senses, not through your ideas. But he said Marx made a mistake, uh, namely that he reduced census human activities to the economy um, and to production. And well, he said, uh, Freud is more interesting because he has a different kind of census human activity. And this is census human activities between people, right? Sexual relationships. In fact, Habermas makes it more complicated. You know, it's a, I don't want to get into Habermas, but his interpretation of Freud is that Freud is also starts from census human activity to understand what is in people's mind. But it is not economic reductionism. If anything, it is sexual uh, uh, reductionism. Right? It is a pan-erotic explanation of history. But in some ways, you know, they all start for census human activities in explaining what can be in people's mind, what is our ideas. So the starting point is material census experience, right? And the product are ideas, right? They, this is, in this sense, they are both materialist but in different ways. Is that, I, th I suppose it, it should be pretty clear now, right? Okay, uh, classes. Well, you can have different view views on this, uh, and especially whether Marx's theory of classes are still applicable. You know, Marx defined classes in terms of property relationship. He had two classes uh, in the Communist Manifesto, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, the question is, does it still matter? And you have to reflect on this. Do you think property relations still is a major antagonistic divide in American society or not any longer? And, of course, Marx believed in the Communist Manifesto. Yes, there is still a middle class, but it will wither away. Middle class will become either bourgeois or um, it become uh, proletarian. And, of course, in the United States, the vis received wisdom is that we are all middle class. Are we all middle class? Uh, I would like to hear your view about this, right? But that's the big question. Clearly, Marx did get it wrong. That's undoubtedly. I think everybody agrees. I think Karl Marx, if he would be alive, he would say, Ah, oh, I screwed it. I made a mistake. Of course, there is a big middle class. Right? Um, so, I mean, uh, you, don't have, you, you don't have to really uh, hate Marx, you know, that there is a middle class. He clearly made a mistake. 
right? Uh, anyway, but you can, you can ask the question, who is the middle class? Are we, indeed we all middle class? Is, there, is it sensible to talk about the big bourgeoisie? Well, there are no big bourgeoisie any longer. This is people's capitalism we live in. Uh, these are the questions I would like you to deal with. Okay, labor theory of value and Adam Smith. Uh, I thought this is a very easy question, right? Uh, Adam Smith said uh, that, you know, all uh, 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 value is created by labor. But then he said, when it comes to distributing uh, uh, wealth or income, it has to go to labor, capital, and uh, land. Uh, Marx, on the other hand, said, well, this is contradiction. If all labor goes to, if all value is created by labor, it should go to labor. And therefore, it is taken away for labor, should be understood as exploitation. Is this an advance or is this a, a misunderstanding? And you can say, well, this is a misunderstanding uh, because uh, Adam Smith was right. He said all labor is, uh, all, all uh, value is created by labor in societies where capital is not accumulated and the land is not privately owned. And therefore, this is a consistent argument. Or you can say, well, Marx actually got a very important point because there is indeed exploitation. There are exploitative relationships and it does drive history. I mean, how you take your uh, position this is up to you. you. You have to argue consistently that, and the argument of consistency will be rewarded. Seven. Uh, well, this is, again, a lot of people said don't do it because we have not talked about domination. I probably leave it because I will talk in the, uh, in the next, uh, uh, how much I have got, uh, uh, 40 minutes about this. Uh, uh, domination and mode of production, and what domination is. Well, Protestant ethic, was he as an idealist? Some people think this is a too narrow question. Well, I think you kind of uh, can um, uh, ask the question, is this really an idealist view? Some people said, but Weber is saying that it is uh, Calvinism which created uh, capitalism. Is this his view? What is exactly his view? Uh, um, is, uh, he is, uh, is uh, very critical of Marx. Um, uh, is, uh, 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 he believes that you know, Marx has a simplistic uh, materialist explanation. It is consciousness which deter it is existence which determines consciousness rather than the other way around. Um, is uh, Weber saying the opposite? It is uh, consciousness which determines existence or capitalism. And uh, that's, that's what uh, the Protestant ethic is trying to do. Uh, and of course, he has this interesting notion of elective affinity, questions whether there is really a causal relationship between ideas and the economy, and you can labor on this, uh, what he might mean. And what you think, this is a cop-out, right? That he actually, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is Marx more of a contemporary social theorist because he has a causal explanation. He tries to give causal explanation. And that's what you are told in political science or economics. Real social science comes up with causal explanations, right? And Marx, Weber shies away and Marx tries to do causal analysis. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Did I miss nine? Well, this is very much a, a very, very similar to the previous question here. Only I ask you to compare the two. Is Marx really a simple-minded economic deterministic uh, determinist? Uh, it is uh, existence which determines consciousness, or is he has a has a more complicated view? Uh, that, is there a contradiction in Marx? Right. Uh, the philosophy of praxis, that we are making history. He also makes that claim. How does it fit? Does he simply contradict himself, or is this a consistent ideology? And, you know, Weber, is he an idealist, or he is not really an idealist? What does he mean by this elective affinity? And then, the, finally, the final question, I think uh, people seem to be liking this. Uh, not easy, by the way. Marx clearly has a, a notion of um, uh, 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 human nature, right? Marx believes 
is a Rousseauian, and even more radical than Rousseauian theory of human nature, especially in his theory uh, of uh, uh, alienation. Right? We are good, and the problem comes as society uh, makes us uh, alienated. But I think he goes a little beyond uh, uh, Rousseau, because he thinks that in the state of nature we are actually social. Uh, being social is in our nature. Uh, uh, right? Uh, Rousseau did not think so. Um, uh, the noble savage has to be socialized into civil society. Marx believes that this whole idea of state of nature is an abstraction. We are all born in society, and by nature we are social. Only capitalism, which makes us competitive, competitive bourgeois individuals, makes us asocial, asocial, and egoistic. Now, does Weber has a theory of human nature? It's a more difficult question to pose. Uh, I think if, if I would argue, I would say if Weber does have one, it is closer to Hobbes, uh, because he does believe that people, uh, the, the history of humankind is a struggle for power, uh, yeah, unending struggle for power, and that's, that's why he explained human history with power struggles. That's about it. That's the way how I would in a nutshell try to deal with this. And I hope this was uh, somewhat helpful uh, and uh, makes you relaxed, right? That this will not be a difficult test. Uh, it will be actually a lot of fun to deal with these uh, uh, intriguing, interesting issues. Okay? Uh, and believe me, I really want you to have fun. I, uh, 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 I think these are in interesting questions. Uh, uh. Okay, now we come to Weber's theory of domination, and that's almost impossible what I'm trying to do now, but we'll try to rush you through. Um, and first of all, we have to understand Weber's theory of um, action, uh, uh, which... Uh, uh, has some similarities to Hobbes uh, and uh, Hobbes' theory of voluntaristic action. Uh, but then uh, we also have to deal with Weber's uh, notion of rationality uh, and then uh, his distinction between power and domination, uh, his theory of legitimacy. This is very, very important. Uh, it's uh, one of the most fundamental uh, concepts uh, uh, in the particularly in political theory, but also in economics and in sociology. Um, and finally, his types of authority. We will deal at great lengths with different types of authority. I just give you a sense what this is in the next 25 minutes. Okay, the four types of economic action. He makes a distinction. The, the question is, how, can, how are we orienting with each other? What motivates us when we are interacting with other people? He said, well, we can act instrumentally, rationally, and I will explain it to you what he means. And then he said, we can also act very rationally. And again, we'll come explain what this means. Uh, we, in, in our interaction, we can uh, led by our emotions. And he said, this is, well, whether this is rational, he said, this is not an unrational thing. It, it, it is not necessarily unrational that we act out of our emotions. And I will tell you when he thinks this is becoming irrational, acting out of emotion. Or in our interactions, we can be led by tradition. Now, to understand this, that, you know, that we, we actually interact with each other in very different ways, over time, you know, with the same person, we can act occasionally instrumentally, or occasionally we can act um, effectually, right? Occasionally we act towards somebody because we have a great deal of emotional feeling, love or hate, and occasionally we can act instrumentally, right? We use somebody in order to achieve somebody. Can I borrow $20 from you, right? Then we act instrumentally. Uh, but we also can act out of uh, hate or, or love, right? 
um, in a discussion section. I really hate the guts of somebody who is over speaking, right, in the discussion section. And then I just will contradict because, you know, I just, it is my antagonism. Or I just sympathize with somebody and therefore I also tend to disagree, basically driven by my emotion. And now I even not talking about love which combines people uh, more. Now what is behind this is Weber's fundamental methodology. He calls his approach to society uh, interpretative sociology. The term interpretative sociology is translated from German. The German term is Verstehen. Verstehen means understanding. Occasionally we also translate it into English that what Weber does is understand. What Weber's strong commitment is that the social analyst, be it an economist, be a political scientist, be a sociologist, be a historian, be an anthropologist, is not to pass value judgments on others, but to try to understand what drives other people. Don't assume that other people, because they are act differently than you would act in their situation, that they are dumb, evil, or irrational, right? This is particularly a debate with economists. Economists tend to have right very strong conception that there is one economically rational behavior. Weber said, no, I mean, there are various types of ways how we can act. And my job is not to say, now you're very rational. My job is to try to put myself into your position and to understand why you did and why you did the way how you did it. This is interpretative sociology, right? This is understanding, first day end, right? That I emotionally try to put myself into your situation and rather than saying, this is what I would do, I will say, if I were you, right? In your situation, would I do the same thing? Why, why do you do that the way how you do do? Assuming that you are not acting irrationally, but try to understand why you act the way you act, okay? Now let's talk about instrumentally rational action. This comes to the closest, but uh, most economists, especially neoclassical economists, regard as rational economic action. He said, instrumentally uh, rational action, he calls it zweck um, uh, 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 is when the ends and the means are all rationally taken into account and weighted, right? This is kind of utility maximization, right? When you, utilitarians define this as the rational way to act, right? That you have, you are striving for happiness and you try to achieve this happiness and in this process you maximize utility. You try to reduce the expenses and you try to increase the return on uh, uh, what you try to achieve. But let me also emphasize that Weber's notion of instrumental rationality does not say that the ends are irrational, right? Uh, and Weber, very much like John Stuart Mill, is quite aware that we actually do have preferences. And there are some ends what we find more valuable than other ends. Instrumental rationality only means if in order to achieve this end is too costly for us, then we probably will go for our second preference rather than our first preference, right? Uh, so, uh, well, I would like to date somebody. Um, uh, I very much would like to date that person, but in order to have a successful date, I have to take this person into a four, five-star restaurant. Well, that will, the dinner will cost me $200. Well, there is another person whom I would not mind to date, you know, my second preference, and that would go with a two-star restaurant and would cost me only 50 bucks. And therefore, you know, I will wait, you know. Is the, my preference for the first date is so strong 
that it is worse for me to pay $200, or it's actually not that much stronger. My second preference is actually pretty good, and therefore I actually go for the $50 dinner. You see what I'm getting at? So you are weighting rationally both the ends and the means, and you come to a conclusion. Again, you know, not all that far away from Hobbes, right? And Hobbes' idea, right? Uh, that we are, you know, we, we do have these drives, we have these appetites, and we have these fears, and then we arrive at a will. This is instrumental rationality. But he said, people can act value rationally, and if somebody acts value rationally, I am not willing to call them irrational. Value rationality, if somebody says, this value is so important for me that I don't care what is the price I will have to pay for it, right? Um, well, let me give you a very simple example, right? You actually may think that human life is particularly valuable, right? Now, uh, uh, you or your partner may be expecting a child. And then you will have to make a decision. Will you give birth to this child or will you have an abortion, right? And then it can come back to value rationality, right? People can say that the life of uh, an unborn child is so superior for me that do I know it is a very crazy stuff for me to have a child or my partner to have a child right now? I will do it, you know, because I am acting value rationally. I know it is instrumentally irrational, right? I may have to quit school, you know, in order to earn an income or to take care of the baby or something. And I actually screwing my life, but I don't mind, right, because I have such a strong value commitment. You see what I'm getting at? And you, you cannot say this is irrational behavior, right? This is rational behavior because people have a commitment to an ultimate value. And this ultimate value occasionally is so high that you are sacrificing your economic interest and occasionally you sacrifice your life. You are willing to die for noble causes, right? And you do it, right, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rationally. You wait, but you, you know that you will die. And if you know that you will die for this noble cause, one cannot say that you are acting irrationally. Uh, a factual orientation. A factual orientation means that you are led by emotions. He said it can be on the borderline. Because if it is simply an uncontrolled reaction to a situation, then it is irrational, right? If you're simply acting out of anger, then you were irrational, right? Um, when you are drunk uh, in a party and you are saying something to your partner and your relationship is breaking up, you, you actually wanted this relationship to go on. Next morning you wake up and said, my goodness gracious, what have I done, right? I was dumb, I was irrational, I was led, you know, by emotions. I said things what I should not have said. In this case, emotion was irrational. It was um, an uncontrolled reaction to a stimulation. But otherwise, to act out of love and to make sacrifices for love is very rational, right? We do this all the time, right? Your parents do it. You know, they send you to, to Yale and they pay $200,000 to get you a Yale degree, right? Well, very well aware that probably they will never get anything like that back from you, right? Uh, they hope they will get some love back from you. Well, they might or they might not, right? But, you know, they act out of love, and, you know, some people may say, you are crazy. Why do you invest so much uh, to, to your children? They will put you in a home of uh, elderly, right? When you get old, nobody will take care of you, right? Uh, well, they, but the answer is, but I love my child, and I want the best for the, my child, right? This is a very, not irrational behavior. Uh, well justified. Anyway, these are uh, uh, traditional orientation, where you act out of tradition, right? Um, uh, well, some people actually still believe in arranged marriages, right? Uh, certainly if you are Islamic, or even if you are an Orthodox Jew, you probably want to ch choose your partner through an arranged marriage, right? 
you go to the rabbi and the rabbi will arrange the marriage for you. You, are, you have to be pretty orthodox. But there are some orthodox Jews who do. Many Muslims who do that. Is it irrational? Not irrational. Uh, actually, one can say romantic love is not all that bloody rational, you know. The whole idea that you see somebody fall in love and next day you propose, that seems to be a pretty silly thing to do. It's not it is much better to go to the rabbi who knows you, who knows your uh, potential uh, partner and arranges the marriage for you. Anyway, the point is, right, Tradition can guide your action, and that's again not irrational. It is only irrational if it is completely unthinking. That's, that I think that's very important to say. Um, there must, if it is self-conscious, you know what you do. I do it because I am a, a Jew. I, I am doing it because I am a fun, you know, because I am a, 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 a reborn Christian, and that's what reborn Christians do, right? If you follow this way, you know, then you are acting rationally, uh, or not acting irrationally, to put it more. Now, what is rationality? Well, I think the key, it's a very complex notion, for me, and there you can have different interpretation, now I will give you my interpretation. I think what is important, right, that the rationality means that you sub substitute unthinking uh, acceptance of a situation and uh, um, uh, 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 not thought out re uh, uh, spontaneous reactions to deliberate adaptation. So when you are conscious about what you are doing, uh, then you are actually acting rationally, or at least you are not acting irrationally. He makes a distinction between rational, which is uh, giving a great deal of thought, and non-rational, where it actually there is still some reflection going on. Uh, Schluchter, a major uh, Weber scholar who knows much more about Weber than I do, though I have read this book cover to cover a couple of times. Um, I haven't read all the 60 volumes of Weber cover to cover, but have left quite a bit of it. Anyway, but Schufter have read everything uh, uh, more than once. This is his interpretation. He said, the question is means and ends. Instrumental rationality is the ultimate rationality because you consider both means and ends. And he said value rationality is a lower level of rationality because you do not consider really um, uh, uh, means any longer, right? Ends dominate. And traditionally, the factual rationality are more marginal types of rationality. Well, um, I would uh, offer you an alternative interpretation. This is my reconstruction of Jürgen Habermas, which said, well, the, what Weber is emphasizing is what is the level, right, of your reflexivity? Do you really think about what you are doing? And also, to what extent you can communicate to others what you are doing. And if you do it this way, you can have reflexivity, which is very high. So you think very hard why you are doing, and you are aware what the motivation of your action is. And you can explain it to a great deal to others. If this is so, I think this is really Habermas, then your rationality is the highest level of rationality, right? Because you can really explain your values very well. Instrumental rationality, there is not much to say. This only I am making more money this way, right? Um, therefore, the level of uh, communication is relatively low, though you know very well what you are doing. Anyway, I just leave it for you. Don't want to elaborate on this anymore. But the bottom line is, for Weber, rationality is really has something to do how conscious you are of what you are doing and how conscious you are of the consequences of your action. You are irrational when you, are, you don't know what the consequences of your action are. Now, power and domination. Uh, Weber makes a fundamental difference between power, in German, Macht, and domination. And, and this is a very important citation, right? Power is the probability that an, an actor within a social relationship uh, will be in a position to carry out his own will despite resistance. You can resist, and nevertheless, the person who is in power can force you to do 
what you want to do. He said, well, this actually very rarely happens in social situations. But typically defined social situ situation is relations of domination. That's what he calls Herrschaft. Um, uh, um, uh, domination uh, is the probability that a command will be obeyed. Right? Uh, the difference right, between uh, um, uh, um, power, uh, uh, the domination, this is sort of my little equation here, Domination is nothing else but power and legitimacy. Right? The people who hold power le try to legitimate what they do. You know, I was trying to do this in the first 20 minutes. Look, you know, you have these questions which sound difficult. They are not difficult. They are exciting. You know, they are, I try to legitimate myself. This is sensible that you try to answer this question. You will learn, you know, you will understand society better. You will understand yourself better if you think about these questions, right? I was trying to legitimate the process rather than just acting out of power. If by 9 o'clock it will not be here, you will get an F, right? And then you will be in big trouble, right? You will not get your degree. No, I did not want to legitimate. I tried to legitimate what we will be doing this afternoon, right? By the legitimacy saying, this will be sensible for you to do. You benefit from it, right? I try to internalize, right? What I want you to do between 7 and 9, that you beginning to believe this is good for me that I'm doing it. It is fun, right? I'm learning. I'm enriching myself. This is my self-development, right? So I was trying to convert, right, power into domination. Um, and, right? and that is legitimacy, a claim that what I'm doing when I'm asking you uh, seven o'clock, you know, not to have a, um, a, a, a cocktail, uh, but to sit down in front of your computer and to write a test is good for you, right? And if you internalize it and you're beginning to think, how wonderful, you know, that I can delay the, this uh, cocktail for two hours, right? Then I achieved. Then I, you know, then it was domination rather than power, right? Is that clear? Um, now, what is legitimacy? This is a very tricky question. And, uh, well, I have my own view. Many people will vehemently disagree with me. Uh, he said, and that's very important, every genuine form of domination implies a minimum of voluntary compliance. That is an interesting obedience, right? Uh, unless I could persuade you that you will feel... Well, uh, 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 I actually uh, uh, could, you know, I could drop this course and not to take this test. This is too difficult. I just drop the course. I can live without this course. Uh, uh, you, you, you can have a kind of voluntary compliance. And most important, an in interest. You're beginning to think, well, I will learn something by doing this. If I achieve that, then this, this is really domination. Uh, uh, now, this is also extremely uh, in, 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 in important argument, right? Uh, that um, uh, um, uh, every privileged group, right, people in position of power, uh, are developing a myth uh, of their superiority. We are developing a myth. Uh, that this is uh, uh, useful for you to obey. So the essence, right, of legitimacy, that it has a certain, uh, expect you to believe in the reasons what those in position of power try to justify their power, but also an understanding that this is a myth, because this is a, right, comes to very close to Nietzsche, right? This is, the, Nietzsche is, sticking his head out here, right? Uh, it is a mythology. It's not really true, right? You just internalize your own uh, submission to the authority, right? But, you, uh, but the tendency in history is that you will internalize it. So this is very different from what we normally say legitimacy, because by legitimacy in contemporary political discourse refers, well, 
Karzai is not legitimate because he was faking the elections. If elections are fair um, and free, then uh, the person who is elected is a legitimate ruler. No, 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 that's not Weber's view. It's not uh, 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 universal uh, uh, suffrage and free and fair elections what makes the ruler legitimate. What makes the ruler legitimate that the ruler is capable to develop mythologies to justify that you better obey the orders what is given to you because you have some self-interest to do so and you have some level of belief that it is actually not bad for you to do what the ruler wants you to do, right? Now, there are different types uh, of uh, domination and authority. And this is where he clashes, right, with Marx. As, you, as we have seen, Reich, Marx developed his typology of societies uh, from economic systems. Economy drives history. Uh, um, Weber is a Nietzschean, a Hobbesian or Nietzschean, right? What drives history is power, struggle for power. And the nature of power, how power is constructed, and how our power is uh, sublimated, right, into a domination, to put it in the Freudian way. Uh, that is how sh you should understand how societies operate. So it is not modes of production what describes the evolution of history, but types of domination which describes the evolution of history. And there are really three types of uh, 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 what he calls legitimate authorities. There are three ways how rulers in history legitimated their rules. It can be legal, rational, uh, easily you can say liberal, uh, traditional and charismatic. And we will spend uh, time on this, each one of them. I just very briefly want to tell you what uh, uh, these different authorities are. Legal rational authority is a system in which um, there is a belief in the legality of enacted rules. Um, uh, and those who are actually issuing the commands, they themselves are bound by those rules. By, this is the rule of law. That's why he calls legal rational authority. It is rule of law administered in a bureaucratic manner. You do not have a personal master. You do not obey a person. You obey the rules of the game, right? And, the, and these rules of the game are prescribed, you know, in advance because before you act. It is set and you follow these rules. That is legal rational authority. This is not identical with, uh, uh, with democracy. It can be democratic or it can be authoritarian. It can be actually uh, a, a constitutional monarchy, right? A constitutional monarch passed laws by a separate legislature, which was or was not democratically elected, but everybody knew who the, who the rules of the game are, right, uh, in a constitutional monarchy, 18th century, early 19th century England, no democratically elected parliament, right? But the laws were there, and the monarch followed the lo uh, laws. That was legal rational authority. Uh, um, uh, then you have traditional authority. Traditional authority, he said, rests on the established belief on the sanctity of immemorial traditions and the legitimacy of those exercising the authority under them. In some ways, you know, when you are obeying your father, you are uh, acting under traditional authority. Uh, the authority what your father has is ascribe to your father by tradition, right? We know that this is something what fathers do have a legitimate right to say, right? Uh, that in fact, you know, fathers do have a legitimate right to say that by midnight you have to be at home, right? They kind of are not very happy about this, you know, when you were 16 you started to revolt against this, but you know, you accepted this is normally what, you know, fathers, you know, or mothers do say, you know. And, you know, you also said, well, uh, um, 
Uh, you did something, and therefore, for this weekend, you cannot go out. Right? Uh, they are acting out of traditional authority, uh, uh, authority which is ascribed to them by tradition. Um, uh, and finally, there is charismatic authority. This is a very complex issue. We will talk about this a great deal. Charismatic authority refers to the fact when a leader is trying to uh, uh, legitimate its right to issue commands that he has some extraordinary character, that he is something like, uh, uh, you know, an extraordinary, unusual uh, person. What is also very important to see uh, that uh, they are often seen as supernatural or even superhuman, uh, having exceptional qualities. Uh, uh, but what is also very important to see uh, that charismatic authority in Weber is not really the characteristics of the individual. This is what we attribute to the individuals to have these extraordinary characteristics. In the most recent U.S. history, during the electoral, uh, 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 during the presidential campaign, uh, Barack Obama, with his uh, 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 you know charming personality, which is extraordinary skills of delivering speeches, was capable to create uh, um, a, a kind of charismatic aura around himself, right? People got excited, you know, almost like around a rock star, right? They, and his whole uh, arguments for trying to legitimate himself was very much uh, uh, cast in charismatic terms, right? Uh, hope you can believe in, right? This is a very typical charismatic appeal. You have to believe in me because I'm offering you hope in a hopeless situation, right? That's what creates charismatic authority. How much charismatic authority President Obama still has, this is another question, right? What you may want to discuss in the discussion section. It's also a problem whether, you know, uh, 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 candidate Obama was really a charismatic leader. Uh, Weber basically chari defined charismatic leaders as the great leaders create uh, the, the makers of great world religions. Jesus Christ was a charismatic leader. So in some ways to say modern politicians, they are charismatic, it's a bit slippery. But I think the emphasis on hope and uh, the call, you believe me, because I will be able to deliver. Yes, we can. You know, I remember when I first heard him saying that. I said, yeah. That's exactly the charismatic appeal, right? It's not quite reasoned out, right? It is, and it moved me when, when, he, when Barack Obama came out and he said, you think nothing can be done? But yes, we can. Hope you can believe in, right? This is very much a charismatic appeal. That's what charismatic authority is all about.